Welcome to the Disrupting Obesity Podcast. I'm Charlotte Skeins, and I'll be sharing ways to regain control over your body and lose an extreme amount of weight naturally. Being fat is about so much more than just the food. It's about your relationship with food. That means that dealing with your weight is about more than just the food too. You have to change that relationship. You have to start disrupting obesity. I've been taking on some hard ones lately in between all these catch up, ask whatever episodes that I've been doing. I've I've been taking on hard stuff for you, like my episode on denial and hard stuff for me, like my episode on hope. It's the time of year. June is very triggering for me. Uh, it's, It's when I got sick and I have really intense memories of what my life looked like right before everything changed forever. Uh, Facebook memories hit just a little bit harder uh, for me for the next few months. And yeah, it's only May as I'm writing this one and even recording this one. Um, But the run up to June can be a little bit rocky. And I mean, poor Sean, right? Because I can usually sleep through my nightmares, but he can't. So I don't fully know what this one's going to look like just yet. I feel like last week's episode was a bit of a disaster and it's going to air the week after I'm recording this one. So we'll see how that goes. As I'm writing this, I can still pull the plug on it, but I think I'm going to let it roll and we're just going to see how this plays out. Um, I've got a note at the top of my page that I made a while ago that I should talk about the implications of being NPO for someone who's been obese. NPO is Latin. It's nil pull nil per oral, uh, nothing by mouth. And they mean nothing, no food, no water, no nothing. I haven't even finished processing this issue for myself. And I don't, I honestly don't know if I can. Um, This all came up for me when I was writing the hope episode that I just mentioned. And I was thinking about thirst. I was talking about thirst, um, which I don't like talking about. And I realized that even though I've said that being thirsty was worse than being hungry and that I really can't talk about what that was like, um, I haven't talked about what it was like to go all those months without food of any kind. And it's not something that I've spent a ton of time thinking about either. The thirst is just, it's too big. It spills over into other things and has always overshadowed the hunger. But I can see how strange that is given my larger relationship with food. I just haven't given myself space um, to look at the hunger because I was too consumed with the thirst. I can definitely see how ironic a blind spot this is for me to have had. It is almost funny. I talk about my relationship with food for a living and it didn't occur to me that that one time when I wasn't allowed to eat anything for a few months and then I had to essentially relearn how to eat, that might be something worth exploring. I mean, you know, it's. Come on, right? Okay. So when I got sick, they stopped letting me eat or drink very early on, like days in. And it was hell. Not the food part so much, but the drinking part. And I didn't just accept it and move on. I'm not sure you can be rational when you're that thirsty. It's a mental thing. Physically, I was fine. They were pumping me so full of fluids. It's a wonder I didn't sprout gills. I wasn't even remotely close to being dehydrated, but I was so thirsty. And I didn't like the person that it turned me into, the parts of me that it brought out. I don't don't know how to talk about this stuff. All right. So I had a lot of doctors, all different disciplines and specialties. We're talking dozens of them. This means there were a lot of opinions, right? And they didn't always agree on the way forward. I'm an unreliable narrator here because I was too sick to understand what was going on. Like, I didn't find out about surviving the Ogilvy syndrome thing until I read about it in my medical file almost a year after I'd been home. My GP gave me copies of everything that he'd been sent by the hospital in the city so that I could try and understand, try and process what had happened to me. So I'm not clear. My memory's a mess and I can't trust all of it. I had ICU delirium and I was hallucinating. I also had bad reactions to some of the meds, which caused other kinds of hallucinations and at least one, I guess we'll call it a psychotic episode. I don't really know what else to call it. It was in the first few weeks and I had a central line. Uh, I think this one was in my jugular vein. It was in my neck. Um, And I decided that I didn't need it and I was going to take it out. What's crazy is that I've labeled this as a psychotic break, and I know Sean would certainly describe it that way, but it probably didn't look the way that you might be thinking. By all accounts, I was pretty calm about it. I wasn't hysterical or flailing around. I wasn't screaming at people or talking to somebody who wasn't in the room. Um, I just decided that I didn't need it, and I was going to remove it. 
um, that one was a reaction to a med that they put me on. So there are episodes like that. And there are also a solid seven weeks that are just totally gone and there's nothing at all. But I do remember taking the side of a doctor, like vocally being, yeah, let's do what he says. I, I want to do that. I think it'll work. And I can't remember his specialty. He might have been gastro. Um, but I do remember that he was pushing for them to let me eat again. This would have been mid to late August-ish, so right around when I start having consistent memories again. And I was very vocal about wanting to try his approach, anything to get food back. But it wasn't because I wanted to eat the food, right, to, to get food. That wasn't why I wanted to eat. I wanted to eat so that I could go home. And that was the weird shift, the shift that um, probably ties all this together, actually. I was in the darkest place of my entire life and I was physically unable to use food to deal with it. So there's that. And there's the way like, I'd always known that we need food to survive. It's just a basic thing, right? Like you got to eat. But all of a sudden I couldn't physically eat anything and I needed food in a way that I'd never needed it before. I was also over 240 pounds while all of this was going on. Usually when I'm in my fat body, I'm eating whatever I want, basically whenever I want, however much of it I want. And I love food. But more than that, I love eating. And that's something I don't think I've, I've talked about it a little bit, not a ton. Um, I differentiate between loving food and loving to eat. They're not the same thing. Sometimes I just want to eat, not because I want a particular food, but because I want to just be eating. It feels good to eat. And maybe this isn't a thing for you, but I'm super sure, like hill I'm willing to die on, sure, that I'm not on my own with this one. It's not always about the food when you're eating. Sometimes it's just about the actual eating. I've been full to the point where, you know, I felt like I was going to puke and I still kept eating. So what do you do then when your relationship with food is forced to change, when you're utterly backed into a corner like I was? And I think it was easier for me in a lot of ways. I really didn't have a choice. If I ate, I would die, literally, probably fairly quickly. And food wasn't available. There was absolutely no way I could get a hold of any food whatsoever on two fronts. One, I couldn't move at all. They could have left food on a tray by my feet and I, there zero percent chance that I would have been able to get it. I couldn't have even kicked the tray with my feet to try and move it up towards my arms. So there was no way for me to go get food. Like the last couple of times that I've been hospitalized, I hit a point where I was strong enough to walk down the hall in my little gown with my little IV pole, get into an elevator, go to the floor with the vending machines and stuff and get something to eat, usually melba toast and cheese. But the first time there was no way for me to get myself food. And there was nobody who was going to bring it to me. I can't tell you how seriously they took the NPO orders. I did no scheming to get food. I didn't try to manipulate people or my situation. Water, yes. Anything, anything that would have done even a teeny tiny something to help abate the thirst. Yes, I would have sold my soul for a drink of water at a whole bunch of different points. With the thirst, I did have those wretched little pink sponges on a stick. I was allowed those things occasionally, but they hold so little water that they're more infuriating than anything else. Being given two or three grains of rice would have had about as much luck satisfying hunger as those sponges do with thirst. I do think it's weird that I didn't want to eat. I think it's probably a physical thing. I was so full of infection and I was running really high fevers a lot of the time, like soaking through my bedding three, four plus times a day. So my body didn't want food. With the Ogilvy's, I lost the ability to process food because it's an intestinal paralysis, right? I didn't just relearn walking and sitting and rolling over. I relearned eating too. I went into the hospital midway through June and I was NPO for over two months reintroducing food was a horrible experience. When I was awake, I was basically in one of two states. I was nauseous or I was vomiting. 
That was it. It didn't matter what I tried to eat or how little of it, even a mouthful, and I would start throwing up within minutes. And not like dainty little spit-ups either. We're talking body-racking heaves that would last for up to 15 minutes and leave me sweating, shaky, and completely exhausted. And this wasn't even the food food part of reintroducing food. We're still talking about juice, clear broths, flat ginger ale. The thing I counted on my entire life wasn't there for me anymore. It wasn't an option. Worse, food had become the enemy. I had to get my body to hold down food. I couldn't get better without eating, but eating was making me sick. It's a really crazy position to be in. And it was scary too. I was living in a survival state. I was pretty close to primal and damn near feral at several points too. Eating should be automatic. It's supposed to be easy. But I lost those automatic things. The most basic human functions were stripped away. I couldn't do anything either than lie there and breathe. But I was on oxygen the whole five months. If you don't eat, you don't poop. So I didn't do that either. I had a catheter, so I didn't do that. I was on tons of insulin to regulate my blood sugar and a constant stream of other meds that did all kinds of things that I know virtually nothing about. Eating, sleeping, breathing, these are basic human functions. If you can't do them properly, you're miserable and your life starts to feel outside of your own control. Ask any insomniac about the misery that comes with a broken relationship with sleep, about how it feels to have lost that level of control over a basic and very necessary human function, something that's supposed to be easy. When you're obese, you know all about the misery that comes with a broken relationship with food. When that dynamic is out of control one way or the other. I've been on both sides of the pendulum swing. I've gone from eating thousands of calories every day. My TDEE was 3,500 when I was at my heaviest. And I was gaining weight right up until I started intermittent fasting and eating whatever I wanted, just less of it. So I was taking in a solid 4,000 calories plus every day at my heaviest. And I've ridden the pendulum all the way back across to eating absolutely nothing, not a single thing for months. It's so unsettling when those most basic, just the most basic functions aren't working. They're not automatic anymore. You don't feel safe anymore when you can't trust them or trust yourself. I was just existing. I couldn't hold a phone or concentrate to read. There was nothing but the constant checks from nurses, the grind of physiotherapy. I wasn't eating, so there were no meals to break up the days or help me to hold on to some semblance of time. I might wake up in the early evening thinking it was morning of the next day. Nothing was automatic anymore. Nothing was easy not even eating. And I had always been good at eating. I excelled at eating. And now it was an ordeal from start to finish. To be released, I had to be able to take in at least 1,200 calories on my own each day. And this was over and above the calories that I was getting through the IV. So everything was logged counted. Now, you'd think that once I got home and I wasn't getting the TPN anymore, I'd keep losing weight if only relatively slowly, right? Like I had been. That is not what happened. You might also think that since I was more than 100 pounds overweight when I got sick and being overweight made sick being sick so much harder, you might be thinking that I would have fought really hard to keep the weight off that I'd lost. That is also not what happened. Even though I'd been NPO for months, and before that I'd never gone more than a day without having something to eat, But again, if you're thinking that it was going without food or drink that changed my relationship with food, I'm sorry, but you'd you'd be very, very wrong. If anything, abstinence made it worse. I did lose a whack of weight when I was in the hospital. Being sick burns a lot of calories. I was on TPN, the IV nutrition, right up until the morning I left for home. I was being pumped just as full of calories as I was being pumped full of saline but I still lost weight, not nearly as much as I thought I was going to, given that I couldn't eat anything. I don't remember what the number was. I just, I remember that I looked forward to it when they said I was strong enough to step onto the scale and stand there unsupported for a couple of seconds. I started to use the word excited, but 
I wasn't really capable of getting excited about anything at that point. I was curious though. And I did think that I must have lost a whole bunch of weight. And then I was super disappointed. I clearly remember how surprised I felt standing there. But I also know that there were points that my TPN was over 3000 calories a day. So it makes sense that I didn't like drop a hundred pounds, but it was still a surprise in the moment. And then I came home from the hospital and I gained a whole bunch of weight, lots of weight, got home in November and just gained all the way through till February, which probably doesn't sound like a very long time. But once I tell you that I gained more than 40 pounds, it's actually quite a bit. Forcing my relationship with food to change hadn't actually changed anything abstinence had accomplished exactly diddly and squat. Taking the food away didn't teach me how to handle my relationship with food. I came home and I panic ate. I ate for all my favorite reasons. And I started to say that I was mainly eating to comfort and cope. But the truth is, now that we're stopping to think about all of this, I was rewarding the hell out of myself too. I lived. I survived. There was a lot to celebrate. But This is where the made-for-TV movie part of the story ends. This is where I start to get pissed off with the representation I see. Like, I've I've talked very recently about some of my after-school special or made-for-TV moments, right? Wondering who was screaming and realizing it was me, my whole relationship with Nick. Uh, The way having a chest tube put in is every bit as painful as it looks like it is on Grey's Anatomy. But on those shows and in those movies, all of a sudden the sick person is like declared better and they get better and they just stride away from the brink of death and go back to their lives. And yeah, so that that is not what happens. That's that's not the way the story ends. It is a slow crawl back to normalcy and normal starts to become really relative in a very big hurry. In some ways, things were harder once I got home. I mean, yeah, I I could walk now with a walker and the 10 feet from the living room to the bathroom were a pretty big challenge. Stairs were still almost impossible. I built up endurance with sitting, but probably the fastest, that was probably the easiest thing to build back up. But it was still seven or eight months before I was considered strong enough for the surgery that I needed basically since I got sick. My primary obsession when it came to my health though, when I got home, was just getting well enough to feel something like myself again, to get stronger. And I was fixating on my diabetes, not on the scale. Ultimately, the scale played a huge role in getting my diabetes under control and getting off insulin, but I did it through what I was eating, my diet, as opposed to dieting, right? I'm I'm trying to get braver about talking about my diabetes. And it isn't that I've hidden it, I just haven't really gone into it because I don't have type 1 or type 2 or even pre-diabetes. I have secondary diabetes, basically because I'm missing part of my pancreas. Uh, And it's not very common. It's like 1% to 2% of all diabetics. So I don't talk about it because of that. And I don't talk about it because I can't beat it. I can manage my diabetes. I've gotten off insulin twice, the first time several months after I got home from the hospital and the second time two years ago after I got sick with the pancreatic pseudocyst. I was only on it for a couple weeks that time. I realize why this might not be fully making sense. So here's a piece that I think is maybe missing. Um, I thought I had type 2 diabetes and that I could beat it. Just like get diabetes out of my life completely. I'm not sure why I believed I had type 2, but I did. I guess I assumed that since I hadn't been born with it, I had to be type 2. Like I didn't realize there were these other kinds of diabetes. And I had so much hope. I was just single-minded, narrow focus on beating it. I, I just don't want to share my experience and give someone false hope when it comes to their own diabetes, when it's very unlikely that they have the same kind that I have. Because I, I struggled with this one and I, I, I nearly lost my own hope. It's such a delicate thing sometimes. And I, I don't want to mess with that for anybody else. Ultimately, I can't win with my diabetes. I mean, I did just see an amazing article about stem cell treatments for pancreatic damage. But who knows how far we are, you know, we are out from that. Um, but for someone with type 2 diabetes, there is hope. Um, But when your health immediately hinges 
on what you eat, you've got a choice, kind of. Clearly, it's not the choice most of us are able to make. And I know, Gladys, everybody's health hinges on what they eat. I know. You do not need to send me an email about it. And honestly, if you're still here, this is just going to keep going downhill. So either start taking notes for your email so you can quote me accurately, or head over to one of the Ask Whatevers and look for the Good For You Gladys question of the week. You'll find a kindred spirit. But for some of us, our immediate in the moment or the very, very near future health can be directly and abruptly impacted by what we eat. But that's not always enough. My diabetes is a great example. And this is one that applies to all of my type two peeps too. If I eat too much sugar, my body freaks out. It just does. It doesn't go well. Uh, I don't feel great when my blood sugar is too high. And I don't know if this next bit is universal to diabetes or if it's a secondary thing. But if my sugar is too high for an extended period of time, I start to experience vision disturbances. The first time it happened was uh, in the hospital in 2022. The big tip off that my sugar was off the rails was when I couldn't read the signs uh, on the wall at the foot of the bed anymore. After six years off insulin, I had to go back on it and I was devastated. This time it wasn't because of what I was eating, but because I have, you know, a decent sized pancreatic pseudo cyst and my body just wasn't able to do what it needed to do to get my blood sugar down until we got that under control. Um, but after they got the pseudo cyst sorted out, my vision went back to normal. I came back off insulin and it's been two years so far, insulin free. And then last year I had my little kidney hiccup. And my sugar went too high for too long again. And my vision went. It was a little bit differently this time. But we got things under control with an oral med, not a needle. And my vision got better again. And I came off the med. I can't do what I did when I got home from the hospital the first time ever again. I can't start using food to comfort, reward, and cope to the point that I start gaining that kind of weight. I already live right at the edge of my BMI. And yes, BMI Gladys's. I know they're an imperfect metric. I got it. I'm not even being sarcastic here. It's an imperfect system for a bunch of reasons, but here's the thing. A couple things, actually. It's what we've got. This is the system. And yep, change might be great, but to what? Next, it's particularly significant for me because I have underlying medical issues that are directly related to my weight. Like, I know how everybody gets upset because you see the super muscular, clearly very healthy and fit person with a BMI that says they're obese because math. And you're right to think that that's bullshit. I think it's bullshit too. But here's the thing. I'm not muscular and clearly healthy. I'm actually the opposite of the first of those. And healthy is pretty relative. I do have a few things going on that would probably swing my pendulum closer to the unhealthy side. And I'm anything but fit. I can wind myself on a couple flights of stairs. So because I'm neither muscular nor healthy or fit, and because I'm one pound away from being in the overweight category with my BMI, I do use it as a gauge. It helps me to feel safe to know I'm on the right side of the line. And that's very important for my psychological health. But yes, what you eat always plays a large role in your overall health. It's indisputable. I can already hear the all caps screaming. So why do you keep telling people they can eat whatever they want and lose weight? Because it's true, for starters. You can lose weight eating nothing but bacon and bubble gum if you want to, so long as you stay in a calorie deficit. I didn't say it's a good idea. I just said it's possible. Because no matter what you're up against when it comes to weight loss, and no matter how you choose to do it, if you're not in a calorie deficit, you can't lose weight. I keep telling people that they can lose weight eating whatever they want, because if you don't meet people where they are, the whole house of cards is going to fall apart at some point, and it's probably going to be sooner rather than later. I mean, we're all pretty good at that first layer, right? The enthusiasm of starting a new diet. You're so determined that this is it. You're all in and you stick with it. You lean those cards up against each other and get that base going. But then the second layer's got to go up and your enthusiasm's waning. You're hungry and you're cranky and stacking cards isn't as much fun as you thought it would be. You've cut the carbs or switched to shakes or fallen into whichever fad seemed the most doable. And they're not. They're not sustainable. You can only stack the cards so high. Meet yourself where you are. 
If you start with the foods you know and love, you're far more likely going to be able to keep going. If you're focusing on forcing yourself to eat in a way that you don't find satisfying in any way, you don't have the space to change your relationship with food. If you keep eating the foods you eat now, but do it in a calorie deficit, you will have the mental and emotional space to do the deeper work of changing that relationship. What do I mean by that? How do you do it? I use that phrase all the time, but how do you actually change your relationship with food? If it was an easy answer, my podcast would only be one episode long and my program would be super quick instead of the 53 week long immersive experience that I've built out. The shortest answer I think I can come up with is the 3A way. Awareness, acknowledgement, accountability, and there's a whole episode that you can check out on it. You need to make yourself aware of what's actually going on with your eating. You need to acknowledge what you're doing because it isn't enough to just see something. You have to actively acknowledge it or else you're just going to keep shoving it under the rug. We see things all the time and then decide we don't want to look at them anymore. Accountability is last. And that's where you do something about it, whether it's making small incremental changes to what you're eating so you can get your calories under control or you're changing the way you're talking to yourself when you're thinking about food. Accountability might be the last step, but you can't take it without the other two. If you're ready to start changing your relationship with food, you can download my free guide to getting started for the last time. We're going to link it in the notes and you can get going with the types of changes that are going to help you get your weight off and keep it off. You can do this and I want to help. You can reach me anytime through my website, disruptingobesity.com or through my Instagram. And you can find more information about my weight loss program and my books here in the notes as well. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for subscribing because it, it really does help. Keep trying, keep tracking, don't be intimidated and don't give up. You totally got this. Thank you for listening to Disrupting Obesity with Charlotte Skeynes. If you know it's time to take back control, lose the weight and keep it off, reach out to me privately with a direct message on Instagram that says ready so you can start disrupting obesity.